I should have known something was wrong on day one when they came and they only had first month's rent. Because I knew that I'd been defrauded and I knew that I needed money. Hi there, I'm Tom Natchu. Welcome to another edition of Fraud Squad TV. Now, criminals that commit fraud target many of us in different ways. It might seem obvious to you or I as a scam, but someone who hasn't heard of it before might not think so. That's why it's so important for us to share information about particular scams to avoid others from being victimized. Many of us are simply too embarrassed to share our story, and we understand that. However, you'd be surprised that virtually everyone is vulnerable from all walks of life. Old, young, rich, poor, we're all potential victims. In fact, almost every person that we've interviewed has been scammed in one way or another. Stay tuned for this episode's stories and valuable tips. How can you tell if an online store is safe and secure for shopping? The graphics are really good. The store's name starts with an E. The URL has an S after the HTTP. The store carries major brands. Secure sites always have an S after the HTTP, and they usually have a padlock in one corner. Check it out every time. Protect yourself from fraud. Well, you may not have made that purchase or applied for that line of credit or opened up that new account, but someone did. And once the credit is there, it's in your name. People are going to hold you accountable for paying it back. Many people don't realize how easily criminals can obtain your personal data and just what they can do with just a few little numbers. Sometimes it's done by total strangers, and sometimes it's done by people you know. Without any actual authorization, uh, without any confirmation from what I had been led to believe at that point, I just couldn't understand how this could be happening. Rob bought a home to rent out as an investment. He was working full-time at his mom's restaurant at the time, and he'd met a couple that he thought seemed very nice, very personable. They would come into the restaurant uh, on weekends uh, with their kids and, uh, you know, first name basis with, with, with them as I was with other customers. They were kind of, you know, for, for parents of teenagers, they were sort of hip and cool and, and we got along really, really well. And, uh, you know, over, over obviously years, you just get to talking about a lot of different things. And as we were talking, um, they were sort of telling me about how what happened was there their current landlord was going to be selling a property. As I was thinking about buying a property and had inspired me to say, well, I'm looking at some property. If you're, if you're interested in looking for a place to live, you know, that'd be great. I actually took them with me uh, one day with, with my real estate agent to, to look. That's how sort of informal the friendship was. And, and as I say, you know, um, she was the manager of a business in town and I frequented that business because she was the manager. Um, you know, I talked to her kids, I, I helped their daughter get a job at the Tim Hortons because I knew the owner there, and that's, that's actually how, how friendly we were. And, um, you know, it just didn't seem to really be an issue to, to have them be my tenants. I guess I should have known something was wrong on day one when they came and they only had first month's rent. They didn't have first and lasts. Uh, so they moved in over the weekend, um, it was, I believe, November of 03 and uh, things were okay. The couple asked Rob a few times if they could pay him just a little later. But after he awarded them a few months grace, then the couple decided to dismiss payments altogether. So I finally took the process of, of eviction and uh, served them their N4 slips. The tribunal uh, saw that the, they were uh, just over $3,000 in back rent by that point, but that was going to be it. I served my court papers and to the courts to, to sort of uh, freeze the bank accounts and to or go garnish their wages, which is what I ended up doing in order to retrieve the, the lost rent. My mom phones me and uh, says, "Oh, you know, your your new tenants have just brought in some mail in your name. Opened up the mail, and here was a bill for uh, about eight hundred and forty-one dollars, I believe, um, in my name from Enbridge Gas." Several years ago, we took the FCC statistics and said that someone's identity was defrauded in North America every two minutes. Within a year, it was every minute. Within a year from that, it was every 30 seconds. We can't even track it anymore. They were also able to call the cable company and claim that they were me over the phone and order cable and internet service. And to give proof of identification, they 
had given a fake driver's license number. Rob attempted to call the couple, but they didn't return any of his calls. Now, Rob, who'd purchased this home as an investment, was now instead facing a number of debts. He'd lost eight months of rent, and now he had a number of bills in his name, too, not to mention 12 hits against his credit rating. Apparently, any of the contact information that had been given to the cable company and to the uh, phone company when they had said there had been phone calls made. Um, and this is what I was told as I was trying to sort all of this out. We found that the number one way that identity theft is perpetrated is that it's perpetrated by friends and relatives. While they had given my name, they had given their own phone number as the contact number. And they told me they had reports of personally speaking with me previously about making payments to keep caught up before the services would get shut off. I'd went online and uh, somebody had recommended to check out my credit report. And as I was looking through it, I saw there were 12 or thir 13 applications for credit in my name. Uh, the first one I was able to identify because it was my application date for the credit for the house, for the mortgage. And I hadn't made any applications for credit since then because I paid for my tuition um, with cash. So there was no need for applications for OSAP or anything. So these were unidentified applications for credit and the credit had not been given because uh, it says on the report insignificant uh, information had been provided. Um, but apparently the, the name and address, um, uh, it says something on the form about application was based on name and address provided. So 12, 12 hits is what I took. Uh, on my on my Equifax report, so I, I could only assume it, it must have been them because it was during the time period of when they had moved in till when they had moved out. Earlier in 2007, they filed for bankruptcy, and I got a notification telling me that uh, I think I was about number nine, number eight or nine on the uh, credit list. Now maybe this young guy should have been a little more careful, uh, but what could he have done to prevent from? being taken so badly. Well, what he could have done is, as a first step, as soon as the uh, people moved into the residence, call the utility himself to make sure that the names get switched over to the new uh, renters. And uh, just monitor your renters. Make sure you know who they are. Do some checks, do some credit checks to make sure you're renting to uh, legitimate, honest people. Those are good tips. Here's a couple of more good tips that Craig has for you to prevent this type of fraud. I can't stress enough how important it is to get a credit check done on all possible new renters. Consider getting a deposit from new tenants for possible issues that may occur at the end of the lease period. Once a new tenant moves in, make sure you contact all utilities to advise them that the new tenant is responsible for any bills. There have been many cases where our landlord thought the tenant was a friend and that has turned out not to be so. Take the same steps to protect yourself even if you are renting to a friend. When we come back, more Fraud Squad TV. How many North Americans were victims of identity fraud in 2006? 400,000, 2.7 million, 5.4 million, or 10 million people. 10 million people in North America were victims of identity fraud in 2006. It's usually lost or stolen wallets, paper mail, or someone who knows you. Keep your information safe. Well, this story involves many different types of fraud. Lottery fraud, telemarketing fraud, even something called a reverse scam. But what makes this particular fraudster more reprehensible is that he played out all of these frauds on one single elderly woman. My aunt receives a lot of correspondence. Um, many of them are from um, a National Awards Commission out of um, Kansas. She receives letters from other prize institutions overseas in Australia, in Belgium, in the Netherlands. She's received correspondence from the Far East. I don't know half the time what I have. She has spent several thousands of dollars during a, over a 10 year span. And it's my understanding from the police that, the, that these organizations are well connected, um, that they share mailing lists. So as soon as they realize that there are people that will openly send them money, they pass the names around. Typically how the um, sweepstakes and lottery frauds work is that the, the fraudsters will tell the victim that they have this large winning that, the, that is going to be coming due to them, but that the money has to come from some international source. And that in order to get access to that international money, there are all kinds of administrative tax or clearance fees 
that the that the winner is required to pay in advance of receiving the lump sum reward. If I won the national award, it would be one million dollars. I feel very good about it. Um, you know, when my aunt grew up, radio, you know, newspaper and, and the printed word were things that she held very dear to her. And I think the fact that she receives documents that are authenticated, that have a signature on them, she believes that the information that's in those letters is, is factual. Uh, my aunt is by herself, and as a result of that, I think she's lonesome. And, and I think when you start to read some of these, they very much play on the emotions of the people that receive them. And as a result of that, it's very easy for them to be taken in. Fraud perpetrators get the, the names and addresses of potential victims in a variety of ways. Uh, one of the most common is by purchasing lists from other fraudsters, uh, what are called in the industry sucker lists, uh, people who have either shown a susceptibility to being uh, defrauded or who in the past have already been defrauded by another scheme and who are seen as ripe for being fleeced for more money. It didn't just end with the lotteries for Gene Simmons as she became a tradable commodity on these fraudsters' lists. This criminal, John Stancy, a smooth-talking fraudster, befriended Gene on the phone. The con started small, but the results were devastating. He told me that his name was John Stancy, and he was um, thought I might be interested in, in buying some pictures. And then he said, well, uh, he had pen and pencil sets there and that. So I said, well, you can send me a few of those if you want, you know. Elderly individuals will get sucked into a scheme, and they will lose money. And the fraudsters will come back time and again to re-engage the victim to give up more money and have developed such a rapport with these victims that they'll believe basically anything, any promises that the fraudsters make. He had called her, attempting to sell various items, and then, following a series of similar calls, managed to locate her bank account information and then started to transfer funds from her account into his. I was in the hospital and there for quite a long time. And he knew that I was uh, very weak at that point. He decided that he might just as well take all the rest of my money out of the bank. She had contacted me and asked to borrow some money, and I didn't ask for a lot of details at the time. Uh, she had indicated to me that she would pay the money back. You'll have to get the money for this, he said. You have to get the money for this, because uh, this will be the last now, and then you'll be getting all that money back. I basically said to her that, that I didn't ever believe she was ever going to get her money back, that she was involved in what they call a reverse scam, that it was quite typical, and that really she should stop sending these people money. Um, I would say my aunt did not believe that at the time and continued to send money because I think she was very driven by recovering her initial money. They finally took him to court, and uh, the last present he gave me was an $1,100 telephone bill, which I couldn't pay. My phone was cut off. Best part of a year without a phone at all. Whatever he wanted, somebody else was going to pay for it. We've seen in, uh, cases where uh, we've had individuals who, in the aftermath of all this, uh, have expressed to us that they're disappointed that the fraud has ended because although they're not losing any more money, uh, they've lost contact with this individual that they've been dealing with for so long who they felt that they had a close personal relationship with and whose conversation they're going to miss over time. My uncle are, were very benevolent people. They were very involved in saving the wildlife in Africa. They were very involved in sending money to the Humane Society. Their whole legacy really was to provide money to those organizations upon their death. And I think uh, probably for her it was devastating to think that she may not actually be able to have that as a reality. And I think that's part of what motivated her to try and recover her money. Part of the problem with these mass marketing frauds is that they tend to be significantly underreported. Even a conservative estimate of losses to victims just in the United States alone uh, would take us very, very easily into the hundreds of millions of dollars a year. They are able to uh, entice the victim to pay initially small sums of money, which tend over time to grow into larger and larger sums of money, uh, up, to, up until the point the victim either realizes that they're being defrauded or they have no more money left to turn over to the fraudsters, at which point communication will cease and they'll move on to the next victim. It's a travesty. 
I mean, it's a travesty that there doesn't seem to be any recourse for us. There's no way to protect her from these things. And, and while she's in a position to make her own decisions, the challenge still becomes one of how do you protect an individual when, when you know it's a scam. The police know it's a scam, we know it's a scam. And even in her desire to believe, I understand that, but how do you protect someone from that when, when they can't see to protect themselves? I first went into it because I knew that I'd been defrauded and I knew that I needed money. I went and I pawned my beautiful camera. I even canceled my insurance policy. The last thing my husband gave me was a ring, which I valued and it's gone. With Craig Hannaford, our fraud expert. Now, this is a sad story because the lady was elderly, but lots of young people fall for the same game. Well, that's right. This type of scam, you know, it targets everybody, every sector of the society, not just the elderly, also the young. I've seen some very young people, teenagers, actually fall for this scam. Now, if there's somebody in our life that we think is being, you know, duped by this sort of scam, what can we do to protect our family members? Well, you know, that can be a real challenging uh, thing to do, to actually go to a family member and say, you know, I don't think you're taking care of your financial affairs very well, and we're concerned. It's a hard thing to do, but you may have to actually get some legal help, get a help of a lawyer who can then figure out some way to protect your family member. Yeah, it's, it's something that we're all having to think about more and more these days because, thanks to it, we know we're getting older, our parents are getting older. That's right, and sometimes, you know, people need help in their financial affairs. And, you know, it may be you have to go to court and get a judge to say that somebody else has to take care of a family member's financial affairs. Craig's got some more tips to prevent this type of fraud from happening in your life. Keep track of all prizes and lotteries you enter. And remember, you cannot win a lottery you did not enter. Challenge a caller who says you won a prize to give you all the details of the lottery, when the draw was made, and when and where you entered the lottery. You never have to pay fees or taxes before you receive a lottery prize. Fees and taxes, if any, are levied after you collect. And most importantly, the elderly are the preferred target of ruthless fraudsters. Help the seniors in your life to protect themselves. After these messages, we'll be back with more Fraud Squad. What percentage of calls to fraudulent telemarketers direct towards older consumers? 12%, 37%, 54%, or 80%? Unscrupulous telemarketers will take aim at the elderly 80% of the time. It's difficult to recover money lost in telemarketing scams, so be sure to protect yourself and your loved ones. Never give these callers any personal information. Hi, I'm Naomi Joy. Fraudsters are ruthless. They don't care who they hurt or whose life they destroy, as long as they get the money that they want. So if you've already been a victim of fraud, you need to be extra careful. Fraudsters may try to victimize you again, it's called the recovery scam. Basically, the fraudster pretends that they can help you get back the money you've lost, and all you have to do is pay a fee. Now, it's hard to imagine the boldness of it, but they might even tell you they're a law enforcement officer, and then you never hear from them again, and you never get your money back. So, if you've lost money, be prepared. That person or someone they're working with may try to take advantage of you again. The secondary fraudster might send you a letter or even call you, so be very careful. Don't give out any personal information to anyone you don't know. If a legitimate law enforcement agency can recover your money, they will not ask you for a fee. Now Fraud Squad TV takes it to the streets to hear more of your stories. I'm here to tell you about a friend of mine who had his identity stolen in Halifax by somebody with the same name. Uh, who used his credit information to get a mortgage and a bunch of loans. Well, you know, when he went into the bank and realized that um, there was a mortgage in his name with his social insurance number and that the guy with the same name who had never corrected it, who stole his identity, um, he uh, didn't know what to do at first and really what he should have done is gone right to the bank manager. But it, it took him a while to figure out what to do and how to get around it. Even though he was able to find the guy and confront him, it still took him almost 10 years before he could get any credit or a mortgage. My father-in-law, he had moved from his apartment into another apartment. The people that moved into the apartment took a credit card slip that was mailed to him with information. They sent it back in. The credit card was approved. They actually activated it, maxed it out, and now he's, he's got a bad credit. So when you move, please make sure that you change your address. When you're moving from your home, if you're switching homes, your banks, your statements, your work, 
everything, your social insurance, your health card, you need to do this. You have to protect yourself because nobody else will. Just about a month ago, I had a, a situation where uh, somebody had either rescanned my debit card or at least seen my debit card and was able to recreate the PIN number and they uh, tried to take $500 out of my account and that wasn't allowed. Then they tried again for $100 and that actually went through and uh, that was flagged by my bank. And they caught it in time but ended up freezing my card for about a week. Well, you got to be absolutely very careful when it comes to using your debit card. I mean, always cover it up with your, with your hand or whatever you can do. Try to move it away if it's in a fixed position because I've heard of cameras that are even pointing at it to, to read it. I don't even know how this guy read mine for that matter, but I'm extra careful with it now for sure. I, uh, this fellow came up to me on the street. He told me that he had a bank statement that uh, was a transfer of funds. And so if I just put it in my bank, he would then, uh, we would take money out of my bank and then a week later I'd get paid back. But this guy, he, was, he said he was in trouble. He said that he was from Windsor. He was in Toronto and he lost all his, his wallet and things. I don't know why he had a bank transfer statement or whatever that is. My bank account doesn't allow me to put, take out money right away. So I used my dad's bank account. So I ended up basically robbing my dad of about $500. Afterwards, like after I gave him the money that was actually my dad's, he's like, you know what, thanks so much for your help. Here's $20. And I was like, yeah, I just got $20 of my dad's own money that he stole from me. Thanks again for sharing your stories. By telling us your stories, we just might prevent someone else from falling for the same scam. If you want to learn more about protecting yourself from fraud, or if you have a story to share, visit our website at fraudsquadtv.com. Let's fight fraud together. Well, that's a wrap on another episode of Fraud Squad TV. If you're interested in this episode's stories, you can read more about them on our website, or we'd especially like it if you'd tell us a fraud that might have happened to you. All you have to do is go to fraudsquadtv.com. Remember, we're all in this fighting fraud together. <laughs>